A Land Remembered, Chapter 9 Ten miles down the river, Tobias left the woods and turned east. Here he entered a prairie dotted with palmetto and broken occasionally by cypress stands and clumps of cabbage palms. There was an early morning ha haze over the land, adding to the m majesty of its vastness. Flights of egrets and herons gl glided gracefully over the brown grass, and then landed in cypress stands, turning the trees into solid masses of white and gray. Mile after mile, the wagon creaked forward, and it seemed to, to Tobias that the prairie was endless. Uh, I hear there were no circular border of thick forests like on the Alachua savanna, but like the savanna, he could see herds of deer moving across the land, and also wild cattle. Once he came within a hundred yards of a small herd, and when he stopped to look, the cows jerked their heads up quickly, standing alert as they stared at him for a moment, then wheeled and bounded away. For a half mile, they thundered over the ground. Then they stopped and ignored him and continued to graze. At noon, he stopped at a cypress stand and ate the fried coon Emma had prepared for him, washing it down with the water from the canteen that had come with the horse. To stretch his legs, he walked over to the stand, that l the little island of pond cypress was so thick he found it difficult to enter, and he made his way toward the center. He thought in his this one stand alone there were enough cypress poles to fence the entire prairie. He was startled when he heard the sound just ahead of him, a combination grunting growl. He stepped cautiously around a tree and came face to face with a wild boar. Man and animal looked at each other for a moment, both equally surprised by the other's sudden pres presence. Then Tobias slowly backed away, leaving the boar sole claim to its prairie home. He hoped it would stay there and not come his way. It was late afternoon when Tobias reached the trading post. The cypress shack was on the west side of an inlet to the north of Fort Pierce. He hitched the horse and stood for several minutes, gazing out across the water, thinking that someday he would bring Emma and Zek here to walk the beach and gather shells, or to sit on the sand and watch the gulls and pelicans at play. The proprietor of, of the trading post, Elias Thompson, was a short, fat man in his fifties, with a bald head and a tomato-red face. When Tobias entered, he said, Howdy, I seen you coming a good while ago. That wagon's a load for one hoss to pull. What you need is a buckboard. It ain't as heavy and it rides better on the prairie. Oxen is what you ought to have to pull that farm wagon. I had oxen once, Tobias said, but all I got now is the horse. It'll have to do. What can I do for you? Thompson then asked. I've got coon skins to trade, a lot of them. You got any cash money? I mean silver or gold coins, not confederate paper. That stuff ain't worth shucks, but some folks still try to pass it off on me. I got a little, and it's coins. Well, them coon skins ain't worth much. And besides that, I got hardly no supplies at all. Things is scarce everywhere now. Fellow came through here the other day, told me it's not so bad up in Georgia and Alabama. That folks is eating pine cones and sassafras roots. Folks is in real bad shape on account of the war down tur tore up everything. Only goods I can get comes on a schooner out of Baltimore. And it sure ain't much. What is it you got in mind? Mainly I want a Dutch oven and a little wheat flour if you got it. And I could use some salt. I got no flour at all and I ain't seen a Dutch oven in five years. It all went into cannonballs. But I got some salt. I wouldn't give my cash money for salt, Tobias said. Will you take the skins in trade? Yeah, I'll take them. Next time the schooner comes, I'll send them north. Folks up there has still got the money to buy stuff like that. The schooner captain told me what they really want now is polecat hides. Bring as much as two dollars each. Now ain't that something? Polecat hides. I reckon the women up there fancy a coat with white stripes. Next time you come in, bring me some if you can figure out a way to relieve a skunk of his hide without getting the worst end of it. I'll think on it, Tobias said, but I don't relish the idea of trapping skunks. I got sprayed once and had to stay out in the barn for a week. Where you live? Thompson asked. On the east side of the Kissimmee, a full day's travel from here. I hear them little steamboats is going to start running the river again down to Lake Okeechobee. I bet you could sell them boatmen some alligator hides. Gator hides bring it from a buck fifty to three dollars now, depending on the size, and the tail meat is as good as beef. You could probably sell fresh deer meat, too. Nowadays, it's easy to sell anything a man can eat if you can find somebody with cash. I've never seen a boat on the river since I've lived there, but if they come again, I'll know it. The place is right off the bank. Tobias went outside, brought in the skins, and put them on the counter. 
Thompson examined them briefly and said, eh, Them's real good hides. I can let you have ten pounds of salt in trade. Done, Tobias said. Disappointed about the other things, but glad to at least get salt out of the long trip. When Thompson came back with the salt, he said, You got a gun? I've got a rifle and a pistol, both of them military. You want some shells? That's one thing they got plenty of up north, leftover ammunition. I bought three whole cases off the schooner. I can let you have a couple of boxes for a dollar cash. Are they 44s? That's right. I'll take them, Tobias then said, surprised by the offer. But I want four boxes. Here's two dollars cash. Tobias put the shells and the salt into a cloth sack. Next time the supply boat comes, ask about a Dutch oven. I want one real bad, and I'll pay cash if I have to. I'll do that. Thompson followed Tobias to the wagon and said, You gonna travel out there at night? Nope. I'll go a ways before it gets too dark and make camp. Then I'll move on at sunup. You best be real careful, Thompson warned, a seriousness in his voice. Since the war's there, war, there's been a lot of drifters in these parts. There's a lot of men scouting around now looking for something to eat, and maybe for somebody to kill, too. One day last month, about 15 come by here in one pack, riding horses, and they was the meanest-looking bunch I ever seen. Looked as if they'd as soon kill a man as look at him. They plumb scared the hell out of me, and my boots shook till they finally rode off. You best watch out for yourself. A man ought not to be out on the prairie alone. I'll keep a sharp eye, Tobias said, and I rightly thank you for the warning. As the wagon creaked away, Thompson shouted, What you need is a buckboard! You decide to trade off that wagon, let me know, and I'll see if I can find one. Tobias waved back it to him. The last rays of sundown were vanishing rapidly when Tobias stopped at a small hammock and unhitched the horse. Then he gathered palm fronds, placed them on the wagon floor, and covered them with a blanket because of snakes. He would sleep in the wagon rather than on the ground. He started a fire and then sat by it, eating the last small scrap of coon meat. Shadows from the fire flickered through tree limbs and vanished upward, like dancers performing a mystic ritual. From somewhere across the prairie came the lonesome cry of a whip poor will. Tobias had heard no sound of footsteps, but when he glanced at the far reaches of the fire's light, he saw two men and a woman standing there, looking at him. He jumped backward quickly and grabbed the rifle, remembering Thompson's warning. One of the men said, We did not mean to frighten you. We saw your fire and came to it. We mean no harm. As they came closer, Tobias recognized them as Indians. He stared at them intensely, trying to bring forth something long since forgotten. There was a familiarity about them, something in their faces that tugged at his memory. Then it came to him. He said, I know you. I don't remember the names, but you came to my place in the scrub when the men were chasing you for killing a calf. We remember you well, one of the men said. You are Tobias McIvy. We have never forgotten what you did for us, and all of our people know of this. But we never expected to find you here. Do you not still live where you did? No. Some men burned the place while I was away, and we left after that. We live now in a hammock on the east bank of the Kissimmee, about a day's journey from here. I know the place you speak of. My people once had a village not far from there. I know it well. I found your place and took seed from the garden, Tobias said, putting down the rifle. I'm sorry, but I have no food to offer you now. We have food. We'll prepare it here if we can share your fire. You're welcome, Tobias said. And you can stay the night if you wish. It would be better for all of us to be together. I've been told there are many strangers wandering the countryside. One of the men went into the darkness and returned pulling a sled made of two poles covered with deer hide. Several bundles were on the sled. He said, I do not blame you for not remembering our names. That was a long time ago, and it was also a very bad day when we met. I'm Keith Tiger, and this is Bird Jumper, and she is my wife, Lily. I won't forget again, Tobias promised. The men sat with Tobias by the fire as the woman took a pot from the sled and filled it with from a deer hide pouch. Then she poured water from into the pot and set it on fire. It is soft, Keith, Keith Tiger said, noticing Tobias's curiosity as he watched Lily. We make it by soaking crushed corn and wood ash lye. Then we boil it with water. It is a favorite of our people. When it is done, you will eat with us. Tobias... Tobias appreciated the offer since the small portion of Coon left him still hungry. He said... When you left the scrub, you said you were going to a land far in the south to join your people there. Why are you here now? 
We are on our way to Fort Capron for bullets. The man who owns the trading post at Fort Dallas will not sell guns or bullets to an Indian, and we have heard that the man here will. We need them badly to kill game, and we are on the way to trade for them. I had coonskins, Tobias said, and all I could get for them was salt. For everything else, he wanted cash. What do you have to trade? Flour? Flour? Tobias questioned, his interest aroused immediately. You've got flour? Yes, Keith Tiger responded, amused by Tobias's reaction. Coonty flour. It is as good as the white man's flour. We like it better. It's made from the root of the sago palm, and it is free for the talking. Never heard of it, but I reckon I've eaten a ton of cattail flour. This is better. We'll tell you how to gather it and how to prepare it. In hard times, Coonty will nourish you and keep you alive. Save my people from hunger many times during the wars. I'd be right to please to know all about it, Tobias said. And the man at the trading post did say he can sell anything a man can eat. You ought to make a good trade. Keith Tiger motioned towards the sled. Then the woman went to it and removed one of the bundles. As she handed it to Tobias, Tiger said, Take some of the kunti with you. We have enough to share. Tell your woman to use it as she would, would the white man's flower. I really appreciate this, Tobias said, accepting the bundle. I'll have my wife make biscuits as soon as I get back home. And I have something to share, too, just in case things go wrong at the trading post. He removed two boxes of the shells from his saddlebag and handed them to Tiger. I've got more, and I don't need to shoot as much game as you do to feed a whole village. The Indian's eyes flashed pleasure and gratitude. This is truly a great gift to my people, he said. We will use them wisely, and we do thank you. I'm just glad I had them to share. Tiger then said, I see you have a horse now. I remember you did not have one in the scrub. I took him off a dead soldier during the war. He's fair at pulling the wagon, but he ain't no good at all in the woods and the swamps. He's too big, and he runs in a straight line. Every time I've chased a cow with him, I've I got my neck broke. You remember I told you once before that what you need is a marsh tacky. A marsh tacky can take you through the swamp in the thickest of woods as swiftly as a deer. It is the best cow horse there is. Well, I sure ain't had no luck with that fellow. So far, so far I've on, got only one cow. Where do you keep your cow? Tiger asked. In a pen close by the house in the hammock? That is not good. You could do, not do this at all with a herd, even a small one. In the summer, you must let them wander the range freely, grazing wherever they find grass. You must follow the herd and not keep them penned. When my people had cattle, they would let them range as far as a hundred miles and more in the summer. In the winter, turn them loose in the woods and swamps and they will survive. And in the spring, round them up and put your mark on the new ones. If you keep them penned, they will die. The marsh grass and flood areas along the rivers has salt, and without this, your cattle will become sick. The best salt grass is along the St. John's. You mean if I want to own cattle, I'll have to leave the house and follow them wherever they go? This is true. There were times when my people had herds that stretched as far as the eye could see, and we followed them everywhere. Those who wandered with the herds were called Ishmaelites by the white soldiers. I do not know what that word means, but I think it is something bad. They did not say this of those who stayed in the villages and farmed, only those who wandered the land. But if you do not wish to follow the herd, it is best that you can you stay home and grow pumpkins. Ishmaelites, Tobias said, as if weighing the word. Maybe I'll do as you say. I wouldn't like to be just a pumpkin grower. If you catch a cow in the swamp, put your mark on it and let it go. Then catch another and mark it. You can return for them later. If you keep them in a pen all the time, they'll die. By now the pot in the fire was bubbling, and the mixture had formed a thick gruel. Lily removed it from the fire, then she handed a huge wooden spoon to Keith Tiger. He passed it to Tobias and said, You must eat first. It is the custom of our people. Tobias dipped the spoon into the pot, put it to his mouth, and chewed. It's good, he said, swallowing and then smiling. It's really good. Hope we have corn this fall. I'll tell Emma about this. He passed the spoon back to Keith Tiger, and after he dipped it into the pot, he passed it to Bird Jumper. They would all eat from a communal spoon and pot. When Bird Jumper ate, he passed it back to Tobias. Lily would wait until the men finished before eating. Later that night, after two hours of talking, Tobias yawned and said, I guess I better turn in now. It's been a long day. I need to hit the trail by sunup tomorrow. Keith Tiger said, We must start early, too. We've been traveling mostly at night. It's best that no one sees us, but I'm glad we came to your fire. If we had not recognized you, we would have remained in the darkness. He then handed the soft key spoon to Tobias. 
Take this as a gift to your woman. Perhaps she can make use of it. We have many more of them at the village. And if you ever have need of my people, go to the far shore of the Great Lake Okeechobee. From there, walk south. You will not see us, but we'll know you are there. Tobias took the spoon and put it into his saddlebag. He said, I thank you for this. It'll make Emma proud, and I know she'll have use of it. I'm glad you stopped here for the night, and I wish you much luck with the trading. We'll have more food together before we depart at sunup, Tiger said. Tobias then climbed into the wagon and laid down on the palmetto bed, thinking for a long time of the strange word, Ishmaelite.